here's the thing, Dave. After seeing that goal last night, I didn't need to watch any porn. <laughs> and that's same sign for you. <laughs> and the stadium erupts in red, white and blue. You've never seen anything like it. Let's go. Hi everyone and welcome to the next episode of the I Ready podcast. As ever, I'm your host Derek and with me is my co-host Dave. How are you doing, Dave? Oh, Derek, I'm a wee bit uh, under the weather tonight. No, no feeling that great, but pulling out all the stops to make sure this podcast goes ahead. That's how dedicated I am. I'm humbled, Dave, humbled. Exactly, uh, yes. You actually said you were lightheaded and I put it down to the fact that you were speaking to me tonight. No, it's, uh, I, I know that's what you would like to think, <laughs> maybe, but no, no, I've got, a, I've got a very, very bad ankle that I went over, which is really quite badly swollen, and uh, so I can't really walk about, and I think I'm getting a migraine tonight on top of that, but like I said, I will soldier through for, for the, the listeners and for yourself, Derek. What a brick. Exactly. <laughs> that was a brick I said, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's going to be a very cheery podcast ultimately because yes, we've came back from the winter break and we've not lost so far, which is oh my god, quite unusual for our winter <laughs> breaks recently. So oh, well. yes, we will see where we go with this podcast, but a lot to talk about as usual. We will go down the tunnel and onto the park. <laughs> So before we get into anything, a few stories to cover here. Obviously, the first one that we've got to mention that happened a wee while, it happened a few weeks ago now, but former youngster Dapo Mabudi was in a very serious car crash a few weeks ago in Belgium, was thought to have life-threatening injuries. He underwent surgery and he's now stable. There's been no further update from that whatsoever. So I hope all is going well, but absolutely yeah. shocking news to hear there, Dave. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we just have to wish him all the best, Derek. He gets a full recovery. Yes. Next thing here is legend Willie Henderson had his 80th birthday yesterday. So absolutely unbelievable there. I mean, he was my dad's favourite player back when he was younger. I can't, none of me and you both can't remember him, Dave. We're too too young for that one there. But uh, what a player from all the reports and all the stories you read about him getting down that wing. And he was actually, when me and my dad went to the, the museum as well, just as we'd finished, I think he was about to start a tour doing that because there was a lot of people there to meet him. So absolutely yeah. amazing. Yep, uh, it, it, as you just said there, he does a lot of work still for Rangers. Easily recognisable, and like you said, he's not a player from our era, but if I was to see him in the street, I would know exactly who he was. And that's him now, you know, 80 eight years old, and I would still be able to recognise him. So still very, very popular ex-Rangers player, and we wish him many happy returns. Yes. And the last story here that just uh, came out tonight is that Steve Davis has decided to hang up his boots. Oh, Yep. Not in the way he wanted, obviously, given the, his injury, but he, the, the player, he's done it all, hasn't he? Four Scottish titles, three Scottish Cups, three League Cups, two European finals, most capped British player in history, an MBE. And not only that, he played for the club he loved over two spells and he managed the club for two games as well, which maybe not the way he wanted to do it, but he done it nonetheless. So uh, just a sad way to, to bow out, but what a privilege it was to have him. What a professional. I can remember clearly when he signed for us on loan and I knew we were getting a special player then when I read into his background I saw where he was from he was a Rangers fan I knew straight away that he was going to be outstanding for us and we say a lot I actually had a wee talk with or a wee uh, conversation with someone on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it tonight and we speak a lot don't we about uh, Mr Rangers and we say you know we, we say about you know players like John Gregg quite rightly so Ali McCoy Richard Goff but I think when we look back in a few years Derek he'll be the sort of modern day Mr Rangers won't he if, if you think about everything that he's achieved as you say MBE he broke the world record for, for the amount of international caps in his country all the trophies he won for Rangers and the fact that he, you know, he, he wanted to stay, he wanted to do some sort of coaching role, he stepped in quite li- really what you said. I mean, that's, there's no many players can, can do or can say that they've done one 
and you know everything that he has. So you know, as you say, an absolute privilege that we got to see him play. He was a phenomenal player. He really was. And again, uh, we wish him all the very best and thank him for everything he done for us. And hopefully, we'll see him back in some sort of capacity at Rangers. I'm sure if there is some sort of role out there, then they will be keen to bring him in because you can't get much more experience in that, Derek. Can you? Absolutely. So. It's about this point, given the fact that we're in, still in the transfer window just now, we're going to talk about transfers. But Dave, nothing's <laughs> been happening. Nothing really in Britain has been happening, or Europe for that matter. Sky Sports, I was looking at their transfer centre today, and it gave you a breakdown of what had happened in the in the English Premiership over the winter window for the past like five or six years or something. And compare it with last year, granted there's still like four and a half days, five days still to go of the window, Last year, there was about 750 million incomings and 200 outgoings. This year, so far, is only 32 million in really? and 2 million out. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Mental. Granted, yeah. there is a couple of days left, but you'd have thought a lot more had been done than now. There's a lot of loans, a lot of undisclosed fees, granted, but I think everybody's in the same position just now. And as what always happens in any sort of job that you're in, it just takes that one signing to, to happen and the domino effect happens. So yeah. we have a few days to go. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, I know. I mean, I think we could, every single supporter out there could identify a position that we would all like the team to strengthen. But like you said, Derek, there's, there's very little happening. I'm really shocked about that, uh, that start that you just gave, gave me there about the English Premiership because, as you say, it's usually going absolutely hyper at this time of year, so that's uh, that's really surprising. Yeah, there is obviously we spoke about the silver loan coming in in the last podcast. The, obviously, the other one that's kind of been under the radar until the last few days is twenty-two-year-old midfielder Mohamed Diomandi is apparently set to become our next signing, which has been delayed due to the weather we've been having. So it yep. has came from absolutely nowhere. Which, in fairness, most of our signings these days do come from absolutely nowhere, and we're apparently paying four point five million pounds for them. So. Something I don't think anybody thought was going to happen. We were going to pay a massive, no, no. massive fee for no, like that. No, um, I can't lie. I don't know really anything about him other than what people have said, and they've had a wee look into him and said, "Yeah, he looks actually quite good." Obviously, until he's waving that scarf above his head and the, the ink's dry in his paper, then you know I don't know is it's going to happen. I don't know yet, but. Every signing is a risk, Dave. You know, you could sign Messi in his prime, bring him in, and it could still be a risk in Scotland, given the way that teams play. So I think a lot of it comes down now to recruitment, doesn't it? And homework being done on a player. We saw that, we, you know, the disasters that were brought in last year. And like you, I'm not going to say anything until he's actually a Rangers player and we actually see him play, because you hear a lot, lot of reports, and I'm still waiting on... Uh, Sifuentes being the missing piece to the jigsaw and driving us to the title, which we were getting told constantly just before he signed. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wait in anticipation just to see what happens with that one, Derek. There's, I'm certainly surprised the position that they played that that's the amount of money that we're going to be paying, considering we're getting a lot of players back from injury. If it is the case, I thought it would be in other positions getting getting filled first, but we've got to trust the manager, we've got to trust the recruitment staff and hope and pray that it turns out to be a, a good signing. Yes. One player that won't obviously be coming in is Alfredo Morelos. He's opted to stay at Santos and help them win promotion back to their top league. Apparently took a 50% wage cut and is now on 20 grand a week. So, you know, no money to be, be sniffed at whatsoever, but that's interesting from Morelos there. One player that has technically came back to us is Alex Lowry. His loan was terminated by Hearts. It certainly Clement was at pains to say he never brought him back at all, just Hearts terminated his loan. Clement has said that he wants him to go back out on loan again. Now, yeah. for me, considering we're needing players, that's a strange one for me, Dave. There's got to be something happening behind the scenes there, Derek, surely. Because we have always spoke highly of the guy playing, always thought that he was a fantastic talent and I think we were both quite shocked when he went out on loan and we weren't get given him more game time. So you read a lot of things. You read, a, a, you know, apparently he's been through a hell of a lot in his personal life. I don't know, but I was under the impression that he was actually... I, I don't watch Harps games, Derek, to be honest with you, but I was under the impression that when he was playing, he was playing really well for them. 
so I, I don't know. I know he wasn't getting like a regular start, but I did, you know, have it. A, have it in my head that he was doing well for them uh, but I think there's obviously something happening behind the scenes that we, we are not privy to. Yeah, One player that I think it really now makes it urgent the fact that we need an out and out goal scorer is Seema at the African Cup of Nations. Yeah. He was on the bench for his first game, not in the squad for the second game. I'm not sure about any other games, however, it appears he was injured during training. Clement confirmed initially it was a bad one and he was out for a while, kind of implying months and not weeks. He's now turned around and said he's had an operation and he's going to be out for about two to three months. So that kind of really puts him back in, if everything goes well, in April. Yeah. You know, the season finishes at the end of May. Are we going to see him back in a Rangers top? I, I don't know, Dave, because I, I think there's still discussions to be had between ourselves and Brighton, whether he goes back to Brighton and either the loan's terminated, which is normally what happens in these situations, or does he stay up here to, to do his rehab, or does he go back down with the viewer coming back up for the rest yeah. of the season? I don't know, Dave. It's been an absolute nightmare again, and it is shades, uh, you, you mentioned him a minute ago, Alfredo Morello's gone at international duty, getting a bad injury, and you know we don't see him for months. Just as the player was really cementing his way in and playing, you know, his best football, scoring goals, being a real danger and one of the first names on the team sheet for us, this is what happens. It's just it's bloody typical, Derek. So I will just have to wait and see what happens. Hopefully, fingers crossed, he'll be back for the title running and gets his winner's medal at the end of the season. Touch with yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next one here, Sam Lammers has joined UFC <laughs> Utrecht on loan. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> just, just started laughing there uncontrollably, sorry. He's joined them on loan until the end of the season, apparently no option to buy. I think from what I've read, he's been doing well for them so yeah, far. Yep. Mm-hmm. Kind of a double-edged sword though, do we get a confident player back and he'll kick on because obviously he's on a long-term deal or is it just he really he plays well, he gets the value up for him and we sell him in the summer? Dave, we've said it before, is there must be a player in there to get some of the clubs he's been to. Yeah, from, unfortunately from, it's a snooker player. <laughs> and from the, a lot of reports when we initially signed them, people were saying he is actually fantastic. So, <laughs> well, we'll see, Dave. We'll see. <laughs> Sorry, again, I'm, I'm laughing uncontrollably. Derek, he looks the most hopeless, hapless player that we've had in our team in a very, very long time. I've not looked at him once in a Rangers shirt and thought, I. I can see it there. You look as if you're gonna you're gonna come good. He just looks completely hopeless, and you know he did score a few quality goals for us and set up a few quality goals also. But by the most, Derek, he looked absolutely hopeless. So I don't know. It is a strange one. I hope for his sake he goes to Holland. He plays really, really well, and it turns into a sort of permanent deal, and we can get some money back on him because I don't think that he will be back playing for us if there's a, an offer in for him. I mean, FC Utrecht give us Michael Malls and we give them Sam Lammers. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the the game that I did see they played, I don't know if it was a PSV possibly or one of the other top teams who had won all, all their games this season and this was the first points that they dropped. I might be getting that wrong, but it was him that set the goal up for the wing, so apparently he's been, he's been getting some good reports, so we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Next thing here is we apparently turned down a loan deal for Ridvan from Galatasaray. Um, the deal didn't suit us, so we right, rightly turned it down. Clement has said, spoke on the speculation, saying that we can't have the amount of games and the amount of competitions we're in and just oh. have one left back. So in other words, Barisic. Who knows? I mean, ultimately, he's a seller asset given his contract length he is coming into a game definitely as we'll get into yeah. the game last night so you know I would rather keep him at this yep. stage just now because it was I think Ross Wilson that did say that you know we're, we're signing him for uh, for a long term contract for a reason it's not just you know a one season and, and sell him type deal so we'll see. Yeah no I'm the same as you I'm on the, the, the same impression the boys coming on to a game he looks as if he's making that position his own. And as we saw last night, well, as we've saw in like the last three games since the, the, the winter break, he's he's been fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Next thing here is 22-year-old Ben Williamson has moved permanently to Hamilton. The Hamilton Twitter account tried to have a dig at us by calling us the Glasgow Rangers FC and the GRFC. They later apologised after some backlash. I mean, Dave, I'm no particularly bothered about <laughs> it. I actually uh, find it quite sad and amusing. 
Although, I mean, their Twitter account does have a blue tick, so maybe it was done deliberately to, so to get engagement with people so that they get more Twitter money. That's the yeah. cynic in me, but yeah, it's, it's quite sad and amusing that clubs are doing that. Yeah, I know. Next thing, another youngster, Jamie Newton, has left. I think it was in a permanent deal to Knott's Forest. That's him joining up with Ross Wilson and Craig Mulholland again. And the next last one here is that the goalkeeper Jay Hogarth has moved to Dumbarton on loan. Now, he came the subject of a weird complication as Dumbarton were without a keeper as theirs broke his ankle, which is the reason why he signed. However, obviously, as we'll get into, they were set to play us. Yeah. Due, due to football, UK football rules, he's not allowed to play against his parent club in a cup club competition. So that is despite us saying that we are absolutely fine with it. So I mm-hmm. suppose, as daft as it sounds, the rules make sense in that way because, say, he has a howler, he could be accused of doing it deliberately. So yeah. it's ultimately yeah, protecting the player, yeah. those, those rules. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and also the weird one here and the, the coaching front reports are that we may be signing former Kelly captain James Fowler as our head of academy recruitment, but that was just one report in the media, nothing from it since there, so we'll see what happens there. Yeah. So Dave, into the games, well, as it were for the first two, obviously the winter training camp in Spain went well, we had a behind closed doors game that was broadcast on YouTube and RTV against Hertha Berlin, where we lost 1-0. It should have stayed off here, Dave, because the bedwetters <laughs> were at it again. Really were. I think you watched it, Dave. I never watched it, but it was a, a tatty field. Yeah. Two different 11s playing. We were trying different tactics, and Clement confirmed that he was working them hard in training, and he wanted the players having heavy legs to see how they would react when we have a tough run of games. Of course, we picked up an injury with Dill twisting his knee or his ankle, one of the two. He's been out for a few months and already had an operation. One amusing thing from it, though, was the ref was being a complete dick, giving yellow cards out like sweeties for absolutely nothing he even gave Clement a straight red card for asking the referee something <laughs> and the image is going to be now immortalised of him peering over the cover sur- surrounding the fence trying to watch the game from outside the, the, the ground brilliant I know I think we had uh, you know I don't know if it was a Spanish referee Derek was that yeah. right so I don't know if it was the Spanish Willie Collum that was there or uh, something like that but aye, it was a bit of a farce the game as well as you said was a nothing game there wasn't really anything of any note and it was just basically to give as many players game time as he could just to get everybody up to speed. So certainly I wasn't looking into the performance or anything to think it was going to be some sort of long-lasting effect on the players when they come back for the winter break. So I, I just I took it as a friendly and that's what, what it was. Yes. Next one here is we played FC Copenhagen in a friendly at Ibrox. It finished two each. Sold a decent amount of tickets initially. However, due to the weather going through the storms, yeah. luckily if half of those actually turned up. But it was a decent game apparently. And even the best part of it was the Prince of Denmark was there and yep. spoke to the fans at half time. Fantastic. The, the, the man I know I know as God was there. So yeah, great to see him back at uh, Ibrox again, Derek. The man... One of my all-time heroes, and we spoke about him so many times in the past in our classic match. He's just an absolute genius. As you actually forget now that we're now into a generation of Rangers fans who've never seen him. Never seen him, I know. It's quite yeah. incredible, I know. But we'll get into the games proper now because we had the first game Saturday the 20th of January. It was a 4-1 win away against Dumbarton in the Scottish Cup Round 4. Dave, take it away. Yep, a few changes to the team and uh, Philip Clement put... He's starting 11 of McCrory, Tavernier, Goldson, Suter, Rudvan, Lundstrom, Raskin back in the team, Cantwell, McCausland, Matondo and Dessers. On the bench, Butland, Silva, Jack, Lawrence, Wright, Balligan, Barisic, Devine and Rice. Now, a bit of a scare uh, the day before uh, with regards to the pitch. They thought it wasn't going to be playable. There was an early pitch inspection. But thankfully, the game did go ahead and actually thought, you know, the pitch held up not too bad. You could see at the end of the game it was cutting up a bit for what I'd been through. It was actually not too bad. So the game started off with an early chance for Rangers and it was Tav on the right wing. He puts a cross in and it was a late run by Cantwell. Thought that he was actually going to either head it or volley it and he was sort of caught in two minds and then at the last minute decided to strike it but sclaffs it past the post. And then two minutes later, Ridvan 
with a through ball to Dessers into the box, one to one with the goalkeeper, but saved by the goalkeeper out to Cantwell, but he can't control his bot the ball and it is cleared. And then again, two minutes later, constant pressure. A shot by Lundstrom at the edge of the box. It's blocked out to McCausland on the right wing. Sees Matondo right in the middle of the goal on the penalty spot. Simple pass to him. All he's got to do is turn it, shoot and get it on target. But it blasts it over the bar. Really, really wasteful uh, chance there by Matondo. I was sure we were going to go one up, but still no, no. Then 13 minutes, another great chance. Lundstrom picks up a loose ball and he plays the through ball to Dessers again. Great first touch, but he can't make room. Eventually gets his shot, but goes over the bar. So I'm not going to be too harsh on Dessers there. It was a more difficult chance. Then the 19th minute, a fantastic chance to open the score. And also Matondo, he races clear down the left. A great ball into Dessers in the middle of the box, but another woeful shot by Dessers. Over the bar, really should be scoring there, Derek. And, uh, you know, we'll get into the goal that he scored last night, but really, really wasteful, especially against a team in the second division. It was just poor striking by him at that stage, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you can't see much more than that. <laughs> no. Uh, tw- 25th minute, a wee bit of scared him. Barton did have a chance. And it was a great save by Robbie McCrory in goals uh, to deny the Dumbarton striker from close range. And then... 34th minute, another chance from Dumbarton and McCrory with a loose pass out to Tav. It's picked up by the Dumbarton winger, crossed into the box and the Dumbarton striker, he can't get onto it and McCrory snaps it up. So living dangerously there, but just a minute after that, we did take the lead and it was a corner on the left-hand side. It was flicked to the back post by John Souter, who was at the near post. And there is John Lundstrom steam in right at the back post and nod it in past the goalkeeper. So 1-0, Derek. A lot of wasteful chances, but thankfully we got the goal before half time. Yeah, just a goal for the training ground it looked like as well with a wee flick on header to, to the back post. Just on the, the, the fact that McCrory had to pull out a great save, or twice really. Yeah, twice. It was a case of we had all the pressure and once again we couldn't put lay a glove on their keeper, but we're the ones that have our keeper making the big saves, and yep. that was the first big saves of the, the game as well. So yep. Really, it happens so often. As my dad says, it's a case, maybe the case of because their opposition, the opposition teams are always crowding the box, and it's difficult for us, and we're obviously pushing up, and it leaves gaps at the back like that, but it's still, we need to be putting things more on yeah, target and making definitely. opposition keepers work. Yeah. Uh, and then just seven minutes after that, or six minutes after that, we did get our second. And finally, Cyril Dessers gets his goal. It was James Tavernier on the right-hand side. He puts the cross in. Dessers sees the ball, stretches his leg out, manages to get a touch and flick it past the goalkeeper to make it 2-0. Simple goal, and that was us 2-0 up for half time. Delighted. Glad Dessers get a goal. Hi. Uh, so... I've got down here, first half, completely in control, so many chances, really poor finishing and, you know, lapse to concentration a couple of times, just like what we've said there, could have cost us, thankfully it didn't. But into the second half, almost straight for kickoff, Matondo gets the ball, races it into the Dumbarton box, jinks past two players, gets his shot, I thought it was going to nest on the bottom corner, but just past the post, inches past, really unlucky there. That's when the sub started, 57 minute triple sub, Jack for Raskin, Lawrence for Cantwell and Barisic for Yilmaz. 63rd minute, Dumbarton with a half chance, shot at the edge of the box and deflected out for the corner which didn't come to anything. And then Dessers goes off and Silva comes on in the 67th minute. And not much happening at that point, but Derek, the weather conditions were absolutely atrocious. The wind and the rain was driving down. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have fancied playing in that. Trying not to uh, give Rangers too many excuses here, but it was poor, poor conditions. But then 77 minutes, the three words that we all love to hear, penalty to Rangers. And it was Matondo... In, into the box, a Dumbarton defender goes in for the ball, quite clearly catches the ankle of Matondo and the referee points to the spot. Correct decision, Derek? I think correct decision by the letter of law. Maybe a wee bit harsh, but, you know, he did catch him and I don't think there can be too many complaints on that one if you go by the letter of the law. Yep, and then a minute later, James Tavernier does what James Tavernier does, steps up and fires the ball 
into the back of the net to make it 3-0 to Rangers. Then the 80th minute, a sub Scott right on and Matondo off. 84th minute, a half chance for Lawrence. He was put through on goal, one-on-one. It was a tight angle, but he shoots straight at the goalkeeper. He manages to get the ball clear. 85th minute, Silva showing a wee glimpse of what he can do. Picks the ball up in the Dunbarton half. Runs at goal with three defenders to beat. Skips past two. Manages to get his shot away. It was just past the post. That would have been a spectacular goal, but unfortunately it didn't go in. 87th minute, it's a free kick to Dumbarton on the right touchline. The ball goes into the box and the Dumbarton player gets his head to it at the front post. Goes past McCrory into the back of the net. Dumbarton score yet again. Derek, poor defending from set pieces. How many times have we seen that before? And how many times have we spoke about how poor that we are for defending for free kicks. Just absolute shambles once again. It was Barisic allowed his man to drift off him and that was just once again poor marking at the back. He headed the ball to the, the near post but he was still quite far out from there so I think it's a culmination of Barisic and I think maybe McCrory could have done slightly better as well but a poor goal all round for Rangers to lose but only two minutes after that we restored the three-goal lead and it was McCausland. He gets on the ball and plays a fantastic through ball to Scott Wright. He runs through, stays on side, into the box and shoots low past the goalkeeper to make it 4-1. Excellent goal for Scott Wright. It was much like he's the goal he scored in the, the Scottish yeah. Cup final, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, so then, you know, with the horrible uh, weather conditions, the referee did blow full-time just after the 90 minutes. So we did make it difficult for, for ourselves due to the amount of missed chances in the first half. But like I said, the weather conditions were atrocious. So I'm going to maybe let them off the hook there. But still, we're through to the next round. And of course, we've got uh, Air United at Ibrox in the next round, haven't we? Yes, Air United at home. That's going to be played on the 10th of February. That's at 17.30 as well. So another crappy Saturday night kickoff. I don't like the yeah. thing to just wreak havoc on everything. Celtic know. were drawn away to St Mirren. So potential banana skin there. Celtic fans moaning online straight away. So, you know, typical Huns at home again. And, and one of them even asked... When was the last time Celtic got a home draw and Rangers got an away draw in the same round? Uh, I think you'll just find that just happened there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that leads us into the next game, which was last night there, Wednesday the 24th of January. It was a 3-0 win away against Hibs in the Premiership. Not only that, that was one of the two games in hand we've got yeah. to play, Dave, wasn't it? So, brilliant. Aye, fantastic, Derek. Delighted, like I said in the post-match last night, I'll give you my uh, my reaction here because uh, there had to be a few forced changes in the squad. So the team that Philip Clement put out for this game was Butland, Tavernier, Sutter, Balligan, Rudvan, Lundstrom, Raskin, Cantwell, McCausland, Matondo and Silva on the bench. McCrory, Jack, Dessers, Lawrence, Sterling, Scott Wright, Barisic, King and Devine. And I keep saying it, the bench... That's what I look at a lot these days, just to see the sort of strength that we've got in the bench. And as it proved in this game, certainly in the second half, the bench came to our aid and, you know, we really did dominate in the second half because of some of the substitutions. But getting into the the game, obviously Silva coming in for his first full start for Rangers in place of Cyril Dessers. But it was Hibbs who started off the more sort of attacking on the second minute. It's an early chance for Hibs, and it was Yuan on the left-hand side of the box. He hits a low shot, saved by Jack Butland and out for the corner, so early chance there. But then on the ninth minute, almost a goal for Silva, and it was great play by Rabi Matondo on the left wing. Picks up the ball really quite far back and just decides to go for it. Beats his man down the wing, into the box. He sees Silva making a late run, cuts the ball back, Silva... With a flashing shot, I thought the, the back of the net was going to bulge Derek, but unfortunately, inches past the post. But a great move regardless. 19th minute corner to Rangers. Leon Balligan heads the ball at the near post. It goes across the face of the goal. Deflects, almost falls for Matondo, but unfortunately, it bounces out and cleared away to safety for Hibs. Uh, but then the next uh, 10 minutes, pretty scrappy play until the 30th minute when Rangers open the scoring and this was the start of the three magnificent goals I've got to say in this one absolutely outstanding John Lundstrom 
who I think has been outstanding. Derek's ever since Clement has came in, he had another dominant game. He picks the ball up in midfield and strides forward towards the box. He can see Rud Van making the run down the left-hand side. The Hibs defender doesn't go with him, and he just plays this absolutely beautiful dinked the ball right over the defence. Rid Van stays on line, takes an incredible first touch with his right foot and rifles the ball in with his left foot past David Marshall and goal. Phenomenal goal. It was stunning. Just I think what's getting missed as well, we had some great build-up up until Lundstrom played that pass. The pass was sublime. The touch yep. was phenomenal, as you said. And the composure he shown yep. was, was just outstanding. What a goal. Tremendous. Two minutes later, controversy. Both you, I, and a few other of my friends were all texting about this. Cantwell, he plays a fantastic curled ball into the feet of Silva. He sort of tangles with the Hibs defender. No contact as far as I saw with, uh, with Silva on the Hibs defender. He manages to get the ball off him. The Hibs defender then brings him down, which looked like a clear penalty to me and in a goal-scoring position. But the referee gives a free kick to Hibs. No VAR check. I absolutely stunned. Dave, I actually watched this back today just for this specific point. The defender actually, as they were running towards the goal, the defender cuts across Silva at an angle right at the edge of the box. And then because Silva had dinked in, the defender tried to change direction. And because of that, he lost his footing. He starts to stumble and he goes right into Silva, taking him out. And Silva, as he was starting to get fouled, he put his hands up because he had never contacted them at all. Yep. Now, the ref then, i seen the, the, the ref, he blew the foul then once the, both players had went down, and he then said it was a push by Silva. He never blew it until both the players went down, so it couldn't have been the initial cut across that he was saying that there was a push for. That's despite the fact that's exactly where the free kick was taken from. So that instance there straight away tells me, well, why did the referee let the play go on then if he thought it was a foul? Now, granted, it was all over in about five seconds, but surely the referee should have blown in that first instance if he thought that was a push. I know sometimes referees allow play to go on to see what would happen, but surely it has to be blown for a foul in the first place if he thought it was a foul straight away. Plus as well, why was there no VAR check? That because to me, me. Yep. that was a clear and obvious error. I know the yep. referee has ultimately got the, the final say in it, but surely he should be in contact with with VAR. Now, there was an issue a few minutes before the goal on the 24th minute where the ball came into our box and a long cross. The Hibs player headed it and it hit off the arm of Balogun. Now, the Balogun's arm was down by his side, the referee initially ruled it as a push by the Hibs attacker before he even headed it. But then it was you could see it was there was a wee delay in the game for 30 seconds because you could see him talking on the, the earphone to VAR. So mm -hmm. why wasn't that done in this case? So yep. there's two issues with, with yep. this issue, with this incident. Yeah. Free kick in the wrong place if it was a free kick. Why didn't he give the free kick near the goals, which is where the, the contact happened? And why was VAR not checked? Very, very strange. This is the exact thing we are on about when it comes to VAR decisions. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, we'll get into VAR later on as well because another yes. uh, strange call later on. But uh, back into the game, 38 minutes, a wee scare, a free kick from Hibs on the left wing in, into the box. And then there was a complete free header by the Hibs attacker who heads the ball. And I thought for a horrible minute it was going to just land right in the bottom corner of the goal. But thankfully... It just went past the post. A big scare there. And again, leaving ourselves open at set pieces. 42nd minutes, Hibs on the ball again. Uh, shot for the edge of the box, saved by Butland and over the bar for a corner to Hibs, which thankfully didn't come to anything. So at this uh, at this stage, Derek, I was saying to myself, well, if we can get in 1-0 up at half time, I'll be delighted. Thankfully, Thankfully, a few minutes after that, things were a lot easier. The 45th minute, it was a Rangers break into the box. Ball to Silva, he shoots it, deflects out to James Tavernier. He hits an absolute peach and a volley straight into the coupon to David Marshall in goals. I thought it was a sensational save at first until I seen it back. It got him square in the pus with the ball. Must have been a sore one, but uh, I don't think Tavernier could, could have done more. It was a great strike and uh, unfortunately didn't go into the net. But like I said, two minutes after that, 
we did go 2-0 up from another spectacular goal and it kind of came out of nothing, didn't it? Looking back on the game, I don't know what the cameras were watching, but I completely did, I didn't see the build-up. All I seen was Cantwell get the ball into the hips half. He races to the edge of the box. There's two defenders come out to meet him and he doesn't even get much of a chance to take a swipe at the ball, but manages to get a phenomenal shot and crashes it past David Marshall and into the goal. Stunning strike, Derek, for a guy who I think was a very, very quiet in the game, but phenomenal strike by Cantwell and 2-0 up for half-time. Tremendous stuff. Yes, absolutely stunning strike. And what was really funny is just before that as well, that he was kind of sandwiched between two players in the field <laughs> and he went flying into the Hibs yeah. manager. Yeah. But just before that had happened, as the, the as it was happening, he pulled up with what appeared to be a possible groin strain. So I was saying to my mates, he's been an empty shirt this season for a large part of it. Maybe because he is that good, we're expecting more from him. But... Is if there was a player that was going to get injured, maybe a, a stint in the sidelines would be good for him. And then he goes and does something like that. Yeah, you know, that's that's a frustrating part of him. He is that good. We maybe expect too much of him, but he has been lackluster this season so far. Then he comes up with that. Yeah, I know. Stunning strike, and you know you're you're a hundred percent right in, in this game. I didn't think he looked fit at all during the game but to be able to come away with a piece of magic like that and like I said giving us a 2-0 advantage at half time priceless especially at Easter Road so like we said there was a couple of force changes because Cantwell did have to come off at half time and so did Nicholas Raskin who again I think had a pretty quiet game also. He is just coming back from injury. I don't know if the manager was just a bit concerned in case he was going to pull up as well. So he came off and I think this is what completely changed it for us was the emergence of Sterling and Lawrence coming into the midfield because I thought that Sterling was absolutely outstanding in the second half. 48 minute chance for Rangers. Great one-touch passing into the feet of Matondo, into the box. He makes space, shoots, but just wide and into the side net and Need to work on that guy shooting, I think, Derek, definitely. 52nd minute chance for Hibs. They break the left-hand side of the box. A low cross to the Hibs player. I thought it was a certain goal. I mean, he it, it, it had the goal gaping right in front of him. Hibs player hits a hard shot and Jack Butlin just pulls out an absolutely sensational point-blank save. Derek, absolutely sensational. Save of the season so far, I think, and it kept us 2-0 up. Just tremendous. As that somebody said on Twitter, this man is so good he could save Nicola Sturgeon's WhatsApp messages. <laughs> <laughs> um. Absolutely sensational there. It, it, it really was tremendous stuff. So, but then, you know, after that, it was all Rangers. We really did do- dominate them in midfield. Like I said, Lundstrom was outstanding all game, but St- Sterling was, was phenomenal. Uh, you know, I think the guy sh- sh- should be playing there all the time. I thought his defensive work, he was able to pick the Hibs midfielders off every single time. He was he was tremendous. 69th minute was a sub. Scott Wright comes on. McCausland goes off. 63rd minute, Silva off. And Dessers comes on. And Derek Lee's first touch. The much maligned Cyril Dessers, especially by me, comes up with the most nonchalant, cool as a cucumber goal that you will ever see and I take my hat off to him like I said last night what a fantastic goal this was and it was Rabbi Matondo he the Hibs completely lost the ball it was David Marshall throws the ball out to his defender his defender gets dispossessed by Matondo Matondo picks the ball up in the edge of the box there's Cyril Dessers in the box he passes the ball through to him the two defenders are running it out to him the goalkeeper's run out to him. He basically just stands on the ball and passes the ball past the goalkeeper as cool as a cucumber. The Hibs defender tries to save it, slides in, but can't stop it for getting an, into the back of the net, Derek. It just it was it was a fantastic goal. And I don't know if I've actually laughed as much when a goal's went in, but the fact that he scored it with his first touch and I'll give the guys due, cool as anything, he just jogged to the supporters as if they say, this is what I can do. So it was a great goal. I'm still, the, the jury is still out with the guy, majorly say, with the amount of missed chances, but that was sensational, wasn't it? He can fuck up, you know, so many easy things and then he can do a no-look <laughs> pass. He scored a goal. I mean, goal. come on. 
he, he, here's the thing I want to, I mean I'll die on this hill I think this guy is is going to be a player for us if he gets the game time and he keeps going the trajectory he's going he's going to be a player and here's the thing about, about I mean I know the way saying that he's <coughs> as quality as him but if you look it took McCoy a long while to get going and by today's standards with the fans we would have wrote him off before he actually got going and look what player he turned into be he couldn't hit his own arse when he first came in and by the time he left he had scored a goal with every part of his body multiple times including his arse so sometimes players when they don't (laughs) hit it running they get slated like Dessers has had and you've got to remember there's a human side to this as well is that he's coming into a foreign country I don't know what his family situation is like either. So there's maybe issues going on like that. So he's now finding some sort of form. <laughs> he's doing the numbers, Dave. He's doing the numbers. Well, well, like I tweeted out or posted on X the, the other day, the wee stat that I pulled up, he's the only player in Scottish football is scoring five club competitions this season. <laughs> Champions League qualifier, League Cup, Europa League, SPFL and Scottish Cup. So, he's, you know, he has, he has scored, I think it's about 11 goals he's scored for us this season. But he just looks so unconvincing, Derek. He, he really does. And then, But to score a goal like that last night, and I get the feeling, just by going by his demeanour, he doesn't care. He's, you know, he just looks as if he's, he's, he's saying to say, oh, well, I don't know what all the fuss is about. I'm going to score. And, uh, you know, he has. But on the big occasions, he's let himself down. And there has been far too many for my liking so far. And, you know, the, the amount of chances that the guy has missed also is quite incredible but here's hoping that that's a turning point Derek but sensational goal regardless so anyway oh. back into the game so 78th minute Jack on and Matondo off 86th minute great play down the right wing by James Tavernier and here it is Derek this is the other controversial thing that we were talking about Tavernier down the right wing he plays a fantastic low cross to Tom Lawrence who looked onside or on line with the defender at the time First time shot, pokes it past Marshall, into the back of the net. He goes away celebrating, offside flag comes up. Now, there's a lengthy VAR check, as we know, and the referee eventually comes back and says no goal offside. And then we've got to wait a few minutes after that, surprise, surprise, to see the lines that were drawn up. And quite clearly you can see the line (laughs) that they've drawn up on one side of the box. Clearly you can see that there's a bigger gap to the near side of the box to where the line goes on the opposite side of the pitch, where it's touching the edge of the box. So if you were to put that where the line should be, it was clearly on site. I don't know who the hell's drawn the lines here, but it's certainly another farce by VAR there. Thankfully, it didn't matter and we had the game in the bag, but another dreadful, dreadful decision in my opinion. I mean, that's one issue. The other issue as well, and there might be nitpicking here, and it might be the quality of the image, I'm not too sure, but if you look at where the line is drawn for the extreme tip of the Hibs defender's leg or his foot, and then you look at where the line's drawn for Lawrence's foot, Lawrence's foot looks actually a wee bit over the line rather than his actual tip of his foot. So even if you're talking about centimetres like that, that makes a big difference. Clement has written it off. He said it was offside by centimetres. It was a great move, great goal, but we'll take it. That's what happens. I mean, he's probably just looking at what we've seen there and not just been like, right, we've won the game 3-0. That, that's it done. But it's not really the point. Now, I've been speaking to a referee who does a lot of women's games and a lot of the junior games just now. And he's obviously had experience, not of VAR in games, but he's obviously had some of the, the training and seen how it works. And... Do you know how in Fur Park, the TV images of one particular side, it's at such a weird angle, it's the most extreme, near the corner angle you can get when they're drawing the lines? Mm -hmm. Well, I said, well, obviously it's calibrated, but you must get uh, another better view of that. And it says, no, that's the exact same view referees get as well. And that is all down because the SFA won't pay the money for all the extra cameras. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, it's not. It's not un- unbelievable knowing what we know now, but quite incredible, really. So, 
what chance have referees got when they're getting angles like what we get on the, on the screen like that? Because that for the one at Fur Park, you've seen the instance where it looks a mile onside. You've seen instance where it looks a mile offside because of the weird angle that is given it. Now, they're saying that it's all calibrated up and everything's done properly, but I just don't see how they can give the images and... Yeah. We've, we've been proven in other games where referees, the first thing and the only thing they see sometimes is a still image. So how can they make a judgment on that? It's weird. I know. But, but the goal wasn't to stand. Absolutely baffling. Really was. I'm still annoyed about that regardless of the performance and the, the, the result because it really should have been 4 Four nil, possibly five, with the penalty that we talked about earlier. Uh, on the 90th minute, chance for Dessers for his setting. The ball played to Scott right in the edge of the box. He dummies the ball. Great play, lands to defeat Dessers into the box. Only the, the keeper he beat, but fires it straight at the goalkeeper. You know, again for a guy who scored a goal like he scored a few minutes ago. I'm expecting him to hit the back of the net with that one, but he doesn't. Straight at David Marshall, and it's cleared. And then the last final chance, 92nd minute, Scott Wright, he's played into the Hibs box. He hits a low shot to the near post, saved by the feet of David Marshall and out for the corner. And that is how the game finished. So, a fantastic result. It really was. It was an excellent performance. A few dodgy moments in the first half, but certainly in the second half, I thought we were absolutely outstanding. Special mentions again that I said to John Lundstrom and to Dujon Sterling, who I thought were tremendous in midfield, but three tremendous goals as well. Three different goal scorers. And most importantly, Derek, that is quite rightly what you said at the start of the game. That is one of our games in hand. So the lead at the top of the table is now down to five points and we still have a game in hand. So certainly things are looking up. Delighted with that yeah, for start to finish. What about yourself? Yeah, I mean, can't really argue with any of the performances so far. You know, obviously the the one thing I've noticed, like through watching these games, is it taking us a while to score. But there was no that same frustration that we've seen before in Bill's team and you know Gio's team as well, where it was there was an anxiousness to actually get that first goal and settle us down. It was almost like a thing we we knew a goal was coming because we had so much possession. Yes, when we lost possession, we were regaining it back fairly quickly. Granted, Butland had a few very important saves to make, but that's why you employ a good keeper like that to do that if if all else fails. So a couple of maybe lucky points in that part there, but that's would be the same up the other end if we were forced yeah. near keeper under any, any pressure. So yeah, I'm I'm delighted with that. I'm excited to see us now. That's the, that's the big difference as well. I am excited to watch us because we have some great play. We control the game. We try different things. It's not stale like it used to be. And that anxiousness about, oh, are we going to score? But it's not looking like we're going to score. It's not there. Certainly, it's not there as much, put it that way, if it is there <laughs> at all. And I think as well, if we do, the very odd occasion that we do concede, it's a different feel that we, we, we just know that we're going to get something out of the game. And that, Derek, that purely, f in my opinion, comes down to the manager. I hate uh, I, I hate saying things like this, you know, because we are only halfway through the season. But I think the difference in the team since uh, Philip Clermont came, has came in is quite astounding. Uh, and I go back to what I said in the previous pod. We finally got a manager after all these years who knows what he's doing. He's, he, do you know what I mean? He's instilled confidence. He has got a game plan. He's got a plan B. He's got a plan C. And what he's managed to get out of these players who weren't performing at the start of the season, like I keep saying, is, is quite incredible. So just like you, I'm excited to see what happens. I hope that we manage to sign a few players that he wants to bring into the team. Because if he actually gets players that he wants and knows that are going to improve the team, it will be fantastic. So, fingers crossed. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that you said, we've finally got a manager who knows what he's doing. I wouldn't say that wasn't the case with Gerard and with Gio. Certainly it was with, with Bill anyway. But the difference I'm seeing in Clement between the two managers is the man management side of it. You can see from the players' reactions and what they've said as well is that 
he's listening, he's understanding the players, he's taking time with them, he's listening to their concerns, and you see the way he talks to the players when they come off the pitch as well. You know, he's he's doing everything the way you would expect, and that's how Walter built his team. It wasn't great players most of the time, especially in that second spell he had with us. They were hard-working players, but yeah. it was down to the man management. You've seen that with, with Alex Ferguson as well. Obviously, he had some exceptional players under his under his wing, but it was all about his man management. He knew both him and Walter were the exact same. They knew how to cuddle players, when to give the hairdryer treatment to players. They knew, and I see shades of, of them two in Clermont. He just knows what to do in that respect. So that's what's going to be exciting coming forward. And as you said, when he gets his own players in. The table itself, though, played 21, won 16, drawn 1, lost 4, scored 44, conceded 11, goal difference plus 33, and on 49 points. As Dave said, we're five points behind Celtic, but we've got still got that game in hand. We are 10 points ahead of Hearts in third. We've got a game in hand over them, though. Games to come, Saturday the 27th of January, that's away to St Mirren in the Premiership, that's a 12.30 kickoff. Saturday the 3rd of February, at home to Livingston in the Premiership. That's a three o'clock kickoff. I'll miss that game because I'm away at Steny Hospitality again for, oh, my, for my sins. Good stuff. Tuesday, the 6th of February, at home to Aberdeen in the Premiership. That's an eight o'clock kickoff. Saturday, the 10th of February, as we said, that's at home to Air United in the Scottish Cup Round 5. That's a 17.30 kickoff. Wednesday, the 14th of February, that's our second game in hand. That's away to Ross County in the Premiership, 19.45 kickoff. And then to finish off February, we've got away to St Johnson, home to Hearts, and away to Kilmarnock. So. A massive, massive run of games in a yeah. short period period of time again. It is, and you know that's how we kind we, we kind of like it, Derek. If we could come away with maximum points against all of those teams, it would be fantastic, a great achievement. And again, we just have to keep our fingers crossed, put our faith in the the manager and his his backroom staff, and hope that we manage to get a few more players through the door in the next few days. But we'll wait and see. Yes. So we'll now go into the news. So Dave, I didn't expect to be still covering this three, four weeks later. <laughs> However, the VAR fallout, it still rumbled on. So Rangers stated a few days after we'd done the, the last podcast that we had met with the SFA, said that there was an overriding consensus that the VAR decision of no handball was incorrect. They heard the audio and said there was no mention of offside. No. They were also concerned at the speed of the initial decision and called on the SFA to make the audio public and make and we made a number of specific requests to improve matters going forward. We didn't actually confirm any of the the measures, the requests that we asked them, but obviously the, there was one about column shouldn't referee our games again. That was only really ever communicated via the heart and hand thing a few days prior to that. The SFA released a statement after that, and I'm using the word statement loosely here, as it was more akin to a village council notice. It was absolutely <laughs> shocking. <laughs> The first thing that they got wrong is they firstly noted posts from an official media partner that were meaning heart and hand in that. Well, Rangers don't have media partners anymore. That's a one season only thing. And the only people that call them media partners are Celtic fans and Celtic bloggers. So it shows you where the SFA are getting their information from. They then went on to say that they confirmed our requests were rejected. They didn't say what the, the requests were. So if that wasn't bad enough, those two things, the next part is an absolute fucking disgrace. We would ask club representatives to show greater responsibility in such matters, especially in the context of recent incidents in European football that have compromised the safety of match officials, which led to widespread condemnation. So that was in reference to uh, referees being attacked on the park in Turkey. Now, before we go any further with this, Dave, they are actually insinuating that yep. that us questioning a decision and a process is going to lead to yep. referees being attacked. Yep. I mean, more than that, Celtic have done the same, asking questions of decisions umpteen times in the last couple of years. Not a peep. Celtic fans have attacked refs' homes. Not a peep from the SFA. Referees went on strike. Not a peep again. The SFA even asked clarification 
and audio from a, a recent Euro Championship qualifying game because a Scotland goal was classed as offside, but there was a bit of ambiguity about was it offside or was it a foul or not? So the SFA yeah. have even asked the same questions over the process. So once again, it shows where the SFA stand against Rangers. Now, they went on to waffle nonsense about thinking the meeting was constructive and amicable, but our statement shows otherwise. I'm not sure in our statement where it shows anything else than that. I mean, more nonsense then about the handball being subjective and that the VAR didn't deem it to be sufficiently clear and obvious error. I mean, that's absolutely bollocks. And while I'm at it, the wording of it being subjective in the decision-making process, that actually allows for there to be personal feelings and opinions going there. So they've actually just stepped in it there. If you're saying that a referee can subjectively say, oh, no, that was not a foul. Well, how do they work that one out? They need to surely give a reason for saying, oh, no, that wasn't a foul then, surely, Dave? It is, definitely. And that whole statement reeks uh, just deflection tactics, Derek. That's To me, that's all that that looked at. They thought to themselves, how can we turn this back on them and straight away, that statement with regards to the safety of match officials, that's absolutely shocking. Absolutely shocking. I mean, that is just a, an a allegation against our fans, totally. And it is just a way to, just to try and deflect away from the fact that they fucked up. It's, it's basically all, all it is. You said that the notice that they put out was like a, you, you know, something for like a village notice board. And you know what we say, every village has got an idiot. And it's certainly some of the stuff that were written in there you didn't actually believe that it was an official statement that they were putting out for the governing body of our, of our country when it comes to football. It was absolutely incredible and it just reeked a deflection tactics for me. Just absolutely shocking. Well, I mean, they weren't finished yet because they then went on to contradict themselves about the actual incident. They said, furthermore, the offside would not have been mentioned at the time. And this is obviously in, the re in relation to not hearing any audio mm -hmm, there. Yeah as it was not part of VAR's decision-making on the handball. It was highlighted within Clydesdale House that had the VAR considered the incident to be a handball offence and asked the referee to carry out an on-field review, the attacking phase of play would have been checked and an offside would have been identified. Then they go on to say, the supplementary information was really to the broadcasters in-game and we were reviewing the process of information to the dissemination to avoid any perceived ambiguity in the future. There was an overall consensus that the instant could not have led to a penalty kick being awarded in any event and there was no impact to the final outcome of the match well that's not nothing to do with the, the whole point of view whether it would have had an outcome of the final result of the game the point where they've contradicted themselves is the fact that they shouldn't even know at this stage if it was going to be offside or not anyway because yeah, it was exactly. deemed to be no handball because yes. of what they call them subjective reasoning so they shouldn't even know about the fact that it was an offside. Yep, yep. A hundred percent. And again, for them to, to, to go out and say that this wouldn't have affected the, the final outcome. How the hell can you say that? Yeah. How, how the hell can you say that some a team getting a penalty at that stage of the game and scoring it isn't going to change the outcome of the game? That's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. So, I mean, like you said, Dave, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind now that whether it be the VAR team or the referee himself, there has been an obvious fuck-up. They've reviewed it to find any way they can. They can justify yep. the fuck-up. Yes. They've found a possible offside. They're bearing in mind it's the wrong frame that they showed us. And they said, they, they've basically said, ah, it wouldn't have been a penalty anyway, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. When have, when have you ever heard that happening in any other game? Ever. I've never heard of that happening. Or oh, uh, it doesn't matter if we've got it wrong. Uh, uh, we've we've checked it further down about 20 minutes later and we've seen that there's an offside or a possible offside in there. That has never happened. or I've never heard that happening before. So again, it is just a way of them trying to get out of how they fucked it up completely in the first place. I've never heard of that. I don't know if you've ever heard of that happening in a game before, Derek, but I certainly haven't. Certainly not in the VAR era anyway. I mean, no. where, where Rangers are fucked up in this is calling for Colm not to referee in any of our games. We should have called for him to resign and not be involved in any games at all because his integrity is now in question. I mean, even worse than the fuck up is there's been no further public statement on this from Rangers and we've now allowed a dangerous narrative to form because we've singled out Colm. And that narrative is now we've singled him out because he's Catholic. 
I mean, Claxton Jackson article stopped short of saying the club said it, but he said that the fans now think that. I mean, that's absolutely bollocks anyway. Oh. The only people that care about anyone's religion these days are Celtic fans and absolute morons like Jackson ah, and yeah. Spears who really have to write sensationalist shite for clubs. Well, I, I know, I know. It's, it's incredible. And again, I've said it time and time and time again. Willie Collum is the type of guy who wants to be the main attraction in a game. That's what Willie Collum wants to do. It doesn't matter who he's, 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 re- he's refereeing, he wants to be the man in charge, wants everybody to know it's uh, everything's on his decision. He loves all this stuff. I'm, I'm, I don't care what anybody says, he loves all this stuff. He's he's the man that's in the limelight, but he's realised, I keep repeating it, he's realised that he's made a complete arse of it and he's had to go out because of the way that he is to try and justify the reason that it wasn't given, and that is a pathetic excuse that he has given. He's sticking to it again because of the type of guy that he is. He's not going to back down. He's not going to admit that he's made a mistake, and that's how we've got to this mess in the first place. I don't put it down to religion or other teams or anything like that. I put it down to the actual man himself, Derek, 100%. I mean, the, the irony of it is is that the very next weekend, Colm was refereeing that Friday and it was for the Queen's Park versus Dunfermline game where a goal was chopped off for offside when it was clearly onside by a foot. The linesman was clearly looking right down the line, so ultimately it's not directly Willie Colm's fault. However, if he was up to speed with the game, then he could have overruled the li- linesman. So yep. once again, he was involved in another massive fuck-up. The yep. biggest farce to come of this, though, is that the referees called an emergency meeting with the SFA, and what emerged from it was that they were unhappy at the lack of support from the SFA, not because of the lack of training or, or they're not full-time or the half-hours VAR tools that they're given, but because the SFA haven't backed them up enough over the, the justified criticism they get. But get this, Dave. Referees are actually prepared to enter talks to have the VAR conversations be made public, but only if they are paid more. I mean, incredible. They are paid £900 match fee plus expenses for the refs. And I think linesmen are just a wee bit wee bit short. That's in the Premiership. Now, they came out with and said, the leadership have no idea of the pressures we are under. They are just not prepared to support us properly. We need more investment and better training. They rely on a lot of goodwill from referees, but they seriously fail to understand the pressures that come with the profile. VAR has only increased that and we sometimes feel like an afterthought. The SFA... I've got a massive problem with the referees because they are just not up to snuff. They really are not, Dave. The, one of the only ways to sort this out is to make them full-time. There needs to be some sort of apprentice pr- programme put in place so that they can build up to it, so that they can phase out referees just now who do this as a moonlight. And this is their hobby, Dave. They, they get paid very well for a, a hobby. They've all got full-time jobs. Most of them are ve- in very prominent positions like lawyers and all that kind of thing. So they don't really need the money as such. So make them full-time, phase out the old ones, give them a career path. Now, I was hearing from that same referee that in England it's slightly different because they get paid a massive retainer. They get paid something like 70, 80 grand a year retainer plus match fees and expenses on top of that. So... That's maybe where the difference between England and Scotland come in. But it's, again, all rolls back down to the SFA, not marketing our league properly, not pulling the money in, not getting the proper sponsorship, not getting proper TV deals, not allowing this, that and the other. It all goes back to the SFA and the SPFL, how they run our league. Yep, 100%. Also on the the theme of referees, turns out Aberdeen weren't happy with their no penalty in the League Cup final where they claim Duke was filled by Butland. They apparently had a quiet word with the ref after the game. Tom English, remember him, had made comparisons (laughs) with us and said that Aberdeen shown restraint with the way they done it. Sorry Tom, we did show restraint and we went through the proper channels right after the game. It only blew up as the SFA refused to engage with us and the fact that it was a completely different situation where we were told one thing of a reason why a penalty wasn't given and they gave us another reason afterwards. So, completely different situation, Tom. It's not like Tom to try and stir things up there, okay? Absolute plum, really is. (laughs) Next thing here, just when you think the game in our country can't be more farcical... The supposed independent review carried out in the wake of the cinch debacle with us, which apparently claims that the SPFL's commercial expertise and knowledge is strong with a diverse range of skills. 
excuse me, strong with a diverse oh, range of skills. Deary dear. So, <laughs> so let me get this straight. The SPFL didn't just pay £500,000 to a consultancy firm because the executive from that inept that they couldn't get a sponsor themselves. And then when they finally agree one, it was such a shitty deal that the English women's game get a better deal with yep. the same sponsor. Yep. The executive even fucked that up by the whole since debacle. Apparently, there's rec recommendations um, being put forward as part of the report. The executive now will take time to consider the detailed recommendations by them and before bringing that, the suggested changes back to the 42 SPFL member clubs for their consideration. So, basically, it's going to be a whitewash as usual. Yeah. Just farcical, Dave, isn't yep, it? Yep, totally. And it, it always will be, Derek, until there's a complete overhaul from the top to the bottom, it's going to always be like that. We've, we've been talking about it for years and years, and I bet you anything we'll still be talking about it for years and years to come. Well, I mean, here's a, a thing that kind of leads back into it as well, and a very interesting development that Rangers and Sky have struck a deal where Sky will show one more game at Ibrox, and we will be allowed to show two others on pay-per-view in the UK. I mean, this was over and above the existing TV deal, and yeah. contrary to what Claxon Jackson claimed, it was nothing to do with the SP PFL or Neil Donkeycaster. You know, once again, we've been proactive sorting a TV deal out for ourselves. Yep. If you remember, we sold the rights to Scottish football in India uh, a couple of seasons ago as the SPFL and SFA were so inept at doing them themselves. I'm not sure if that's still going on. I'm not, I'm not too know. sure about that, but that just shows you once again we're taking the bull by the horns dealing yep. with our TV deal. That yep. kind of leads back into the shitty governance of the game in this country. Yeah, and it shows that there can be, I'm not even say it's a loophole, Derek, but it shows that extra deals can still be struck without there being any crossover from any deals that have been done with televised games and stuff like that. So fair play to Rangers for going out and doing that. And here's hoping that's the start of a wee change for us and going forward, more deals like that can be struck because that's what we've been calling out for for ages, isn't it? I mean, see if Rangers and Celtic were smart about things, they should just say to the SPFL, no, we're not signing this, you can do what you want, but we're going to speak to Sky ourselves. And see where that gets us, just call their bluff on that one, because ultimately, all the other clubs and the SPFL need Rangers and Celtic. So, I don't know if there's a deal to be done there, but we will get into Celtic's dodginess with uh, talks with us shortly. Next thing here, confirmation that we will be moving the Union Bears in the singing section to the Copeland stand. I believe in the middle, behind, in the bottom behind the goal, it allows us to expand and steps will be taken for anyone currently there who wants to move or others to join in. So the people will find out in due course. That was on the back, obviously, of trials earlier this season with consultation with fans and players. Correct move, in my opinion, makes them more visible, centralises the singing rather than in the corner, and it has the potential, if it expands enough, for the whole stand to become a blue wall like we've seen in Borussia Dortmund, which is phenomenal if we could pull that off. Yeah, as I say, I know there has been issues with the Union Bears in the past, a lot of things you know that we've not agreed with, but we both are under the opinion that they are vitally important for the atmosphere inside the stadium. As you say, if this is going to make it more central, you know, to create more noise, get the stadium rocking a bit more then I'm all for that and hopefully the upheaval, I know there's been a lot of people unhappy, uh, I've certainly heard a few, even people that I know that are not happy about moving but I think if it's for the better of the club then I'm, I'm all for it and hopefully everybody else can get things so sorted out quite smoothly. Yes. Another big thing that we are trialling is an, a move for away fans to the club deck. Won't happen with clubs who bring a lot of fans like Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, etc. But for those with a small travel and support, such as the first game we're doing it with, uh, it's going to happen with Livingston coming. They'll be housed in the, the, the club deck and the Rangers fans will be able to backfill into the traditional away end. It makes sense ticket-wise to do that as well. Plus, there's no point having 900-odd seats in that traditional away area for only 50 to 100 fans. Yeah. You know, yeah. Plus, you, you've got to think of the segregation as well. There's an yeah. it's probably about 11, 1,200 seats that were, we, we could really backfill there. Visually, it'll look better too. So hopefully, it's the start of the club realising we need to house all away fans up in the club deck, regardless if it's 90 or 900. I would like to see that more often, to be honest. Yeah. It gives us more, more scope for doing stuff. It does, yeah, d definitely. And it gets fans 
closer to the pitch as well if they're taking the corner sections and, and stuff like that Derek I don't see anyone that would prefer to sit away up in the club deck or to get down in, into that area which is an excellent part of the stadium to sit in so uh, I know it's a, it's a great idea and just like what you said with the segregation they would only have to worry about one section of segregation rather than two which they have at the moment so I, it's certainly a sensible thing for the club to do going forward Yes Next thing, the construction firm that was going to build the flats on the land outside of Ibrox, which taken into account Albion Car Park as well, has went in the administration with all staff being made redundant. I mean, yeah. th- I know some people weren't happy at the way it looked, but I think the plans looked very smart in keeping with the, the theme of Ibrox with the, the arches and the, and the red brick as well. I mean, the area needs some regeneration, so I'm not sure where that leaves the plans or more yeah. importantly if the sale of the Albion, the land at the Albion car park was completed and if that impacts on us or not I'm not too sure Dave um, that money was meant to be getting used to, to pay off some of Edmondson House so I, I don't know I, I don't know you've, you've got to feel for the people that have lost their jobs as well so hopefully something happens it gets taken over by another firm or something happens just to get it back going and everybody can get back to you know, working and uh, job security and stuff, but it is, uh, it's other, other things like that, apart from how it affects us, that's uh, it's a big issue also. So hopefully something will get sorted out soon. Yes. Next thing, in rather strange time, and I felt, is some accounts were released for Edmiston House. £30,000 profit for around the seven months it's been open. It doesn't take into account, obviously, the museum revenue, Unclear if retail is included in, in that or not. I'm not too sure. I mean, typically businesses run at a loss for the first one to three years until they're fully established and they're, they're, they're up to speed. So if this is accurate, it's absolutely outstanding. I yeah. mean, just taking into account, you know, me and you are going at, to the museum and the restaurant at, at the end of February. Me and my dad went, as, as we've said before, at the start of December there. And, you know, obviously your museum tickets, 20 quid, with a couple of coffees, we had 80 quid in the restaurant there. So there's about 130-odd quid and a random, I think it was a Friday we went as well, yeah. where the club wouldn't are, are making profit on that, where they wouldn't be getting that before because they've got things to entice you in. Yeah. And I know that people are saying, oh, it's not going to make this million pound as well. But, yeah, maybe individual elements might not seem to make them that amount, but... Overall, for what we're building between the restaurant, the museum, the sports bar, the retail stuff, add that all up, it all adds to profit for the club. So you cannot complain about that, can you? No. And on that note, Derek, I want to thank you for being so generous as to offering to pay for the whole day for me so I can go <laughs> scot-free and I can get my three-course dinner and and, and the museum. You're, you're some guy. Uh, I think I used that joke in you the last time, Dave. It's not happening this time. <laughs> Oh dear. No, as as excellent as you say, going by the early uh, projections for the revenue, that's phenomenal. But, you know, it is something that we've been crying out for for years. We've been talking about it for years. It's finally here. And I, I know that you've been, but I'm really looking forward to seeing the museum as well. Derek, It's uh, I think it's going to be quite uh, spectacular. So that'll be an excellent day out. Look forward to it. I mean, take out the money side of it, just even the stature of the club is enhanced by by doing these things. The sports yeah. bar, I mean, that, that's going to be open, I think, six days a week, I think. So yep. might be wrong with that one, don't quote me. But, you know, that's going to be a phenomenal thing, even just to go there for a few drinks after the museum or whatever, or if you happen to be randomly in that area, I don't know what you would be these days. But, yeah, just it's all looking good that way. And that's yeah. what Biz Grove was brought in to do. So all good. Yep. As I mentioned, we were in talks with Celtic about the resolving the ticket issue. Reports, though, that our Celtic will still refuse to take the 800 tickets that we're offering them under safety grounds. You know what, Dave? Fine. Let them do that. Rangers need to be proactive with this and publicly document what Celtic want and what we've done to accommodate them. Again, we've allowed the narrative to fester when it's all big bad Rangers' fault that they're not allowing us in and all that kind of shit. That's clearly not the case. Rangers need to be proactive on this one and documenting how stupid Celtic are being and we cannot, cannot back down under this now. They get 800, fuck your European allocations, they've dragged this out too long now. I don't care anymore, Dave. I know this fan's going to lose out going to Parkhead, but I think getting fans into Ibrox is a wee bit more pressing, to, for me anyway. I'm quite surprised there hasn't been anything came out, Derek. Maybe that's going to be in the pipeline, I'm not sure. 
But just like what you said, we should be making it public exactly what they're saying, what they're looking for, you know, their reasoning and all that, rather than just putting it under this sort of blanket of, oh, it's a security and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to rumble on again. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I gen- genuinely don't know what the next steps will be for the club, but I'm quite surprised that's not happened. Well, ultimately, we're going to offer them 800 again. They'll probably refuse again. So then when the last Old Firm game of the, the, the season comes round, and if it's still the same situation where Celtic are refusing to give us an allocation, well, there is absolutely no excuse for the SPFL not to take action on this one because the reason why they never gave us or, or decided an allocation the last time was because Celtic never it was too soon and Celtic never gave them enough documentation about what would be reasonable so yeah. there's no excuse the next time this happens. No, plenty of time, yeah exactly Yeah, anyway next thing here is Rangers women's team are through to the Sky Sports Cup final after a 3-2 win against Celtic in the, the, the semi-final, which despite it being called the Sky Sports Cup, it was shown on BBC Alba. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Look at that one. It tickled me that one as well, Dave. <laughs> um, so I, I did actually watch a wee bit of it, and uh, Celtic went ahead with a penalty that never was. Surprise, surprise. Aye. We pulled it back, and then we went 2-1 ahead. Celtic got another penalty in the last minute of the game, which, again, should never have been a penalty to make it two each. And then in the dying minutes, with only a kick of the ball to go, I think, we got a clear penalty for a tug in the box in the 93rd minute, and we made it 3-2. So even in the women's game, Celtic are getting decisions for them. <laughs> Because they should never have been. I watched the game, Derek. I did actually sit and watch it, and I was I actually was drawing comparisons to the men's team because Rangers were all over them. Had all the chances. They were creating absolutely nothing, absolutely battering them in the first half. Couldn't score, and then quite rightly, as you said, Celtic get the penalty, and I couldn't quite believe it. But well done to them, you know, for staying in there. They were by far the better team, and. Uh, we definitely deserved the victory, and as you say, that's him now into the final. So, well done, congratulations. Yes. And the last piece of football news here is the little general, Dick Advocat, at the age of 76, has come out of retirement again to manage international side Curaco. I think that's how you how you pronounce it. I mean, he's had more farewell tours than Don Henley and the Eagles. He really that's has. incredible. Oh, I, 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 I had no idea. Uh, that he was back in, but uh, it'd be sounding foolish if I said that I knew exactly where, where about in the world that, that, that they were. But you know, as you say, how, how old is he now? 76. 76. Fantastic. Well done, Dick. Do you like Dick? No, I don't, I don't like Dick, but I like Dick Advocate, you know what I mean? Hopefully, it all goes well for him and, you know, he manages to get a few good results. But uh, excellent stuff. Well, that's just off the coast of Venezuela, Dave. Oh, excellent. So it's uh, in a nice warm country. Here's hoping there's no any dodgy military coups or anything like that. See, that's you, that's you got me hooked on snowfall, Derek. That's, uh, that's uh, the first thing that I'm th- thinking about there when I'm, uh, you know, when I think about these type of countries, I'm thinking about these uh, 1980s television programmes and stuff like that. But uh, no, no, I'm delighted for him. Hope he does really well. I was going to say his poor wife there, but I mean, it's a Dutch Caribbean island, so yeah. I'm pretty sure she would love life. Out exactly, there. yeah. Good stuff. So, chess winner stripped of title after being accused of shitting in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is this <laughs> <laughs> A Chinese chess champion has been stripped of the win after being accused of taking a dump in a hotel bathtub. 48-year-old Yan Chanlong beat dozens of contenders to be named the Zhaxi King, I don't know if that's right, that amateur chess competition in China's Havin province on the de- December the 17th. The champion was awarded £10,991 for his victory. However, things took a turn for the gross the next morning when <laughs> Yan was accused of shitting in the bathtub by staff <laughs> at the Constant Hotel. On Monday, 
the Chinese Chess Association announced that they were stripping the champion of his title and prize money on grounds of disrupting public order and displaying extreme bad character. <laughs> According to Global Times, Yan had been drinking with friends following his victory. He is said to have defecated in the bathtub in the following morning. His behaviour damaged the hotel's property, violated public order and good customs and caused a negative impact on Chinese chess, the, the organisation just said. <laughs> Yan has since responded, claiming that he got the runs after drinking too much. <laughs> a severe case of the bruise booze. I thought you were going to say it was like fermented prune juice that he'd been drinking <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> it's a belter. Oh, dear, dear. It had been reported that he failed to make it to the toilet in time and he couldn't help but defecate in the bathtub. On top of the diarrhoea drama, he has also been accused of using a communication device similar similar, <laughs> similar to anal beads in order to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> How the feck does that work? <laughs> the Chinese... Does he get a wee twinge? Does he get a wee twinge when he well, makes the wrong move? Funnily enough... <laughs> Chinese oh. social media was awash with accusations claiming that the oh, chess player God. clenched and unclenched his butt cheeks <laughs> to communicate information about the game via code to a computer. Oh my God. The I've device would then the device would then send back instructions of what moves to make in the form of vibrations. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the lines that folk will go to and ten grand, I tell you. Oh, that's mental. Derek, that's, I've, I enjoyed that. That's, that's, that's been one of your, your better ones there, I must admit. Absolutely so, mental. I've got sore cheeks, just like oh, yeah, Just like him, um, exactly. Oh, dear. On that note, we all, yeah. we all end the podcast. Oh, Dave. Oh, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> Absolutely. Just the headline itself is an absolute belter. So that's so it's been an enjoyable run, Dave. I hope the next few games are as enjoyable as it has been. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's been excellent. Last night's performance was superb, and like you said earlier on, I'm actually excited about what's coming up and watching the team. So long may that continue. Yes. So all that's left to say is thanks for listening and goodbye. Take care, folks. Bye bye. And the stadium erupts in red, white, and blue. You've never seen anything like it. Let's go. Manchester, place yourself. Manchester!